but free to drop off. And we're recording. So uh, tonight looks very exciting. We're going to talk to Jason. We're going to talk about, uh, he's a PM on the PowerShell team. And he's going to talk about uh, version 7.1 and a whole bunch of different features. And we'll probably meander into who knows what. Uh, I see a lot of uh, folks joining tonight. A bunch of uh, cloud data center manager, management MVPs. Also, I know them from the PowerShell community. So we might have some good conversations. Uh, and before we kick off, I got a little bit of housekeeping. So if you want to, I'll drop this into the um, chat. Uh, I have a YouTube channel that you can, uh, where I post these recordings. And if you want to head over there and subscribe or hit the notification button so you can be notified for future uh, recordings that I put up, uh, those will be there. And a little bit of advertising. We have Joel Bennett. It's going to be one of our next talks. He's going to talk about doing beautiful terminal user interfaces with his Pansies module. Um, all about PowerShell ANSI escape sequences. So definitely looking forward to that. And then after the next person up after that is uh, James Brundit is going to be on and he's going to talk about his module that makes regular expressions made, uh, made sim uh, strangely simple using something called irregular. And so I'm looking forward to uh, that talk as well. He also based that on some conversations he, he and I had. I had built something called a PowerShell string scanner, but We'll cover that down the road. And that also brings up, uh, there's a few other people that are in, in the pipeline, no pun intended. Um, Josh King, who created the Windows Toast PowerShell module, he'll be on in a few months. And if you feel like you wanna give a talk, we're open to having people who are new to PowerShell, uh, haven't given uh, talks at all, uh, happy to have you come on. And uh, if you want to do a 5, 10, 15 minute uh, presentation or take up an hour, or take up even longer about projects that you're working on, feel free to drop me uh, a note on the meetup or an email. You can find that on there as well. Uh, happy to have you come on. We have a bunch of people that uh, do this from time to time. And then we get a group of folks together to give an evening presentation. If you know of somebody that wants to give a talk, let them know and uh, get them in touch with me. Happy to host them as well. Uh, and if you know somebody else in the community that you'd like to hear from, uh, let me know who that is and I'm happy to reach out. So enough of the housekeeping. So Jason, good to have you on. You go. Good to see you. Uh, really thank you for uh, make, making a time for this. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn it all over to you. And if anybody has questions, please drop them in the chat and I'll, Jason, I'll interrupt you either with questions that I might have or questions that I see people post and we awesome. can go from there. Great. Okay, I can see you sharing. Okay, great. Uh, a little top bar action here, just trying to, well, hello everyone. It's great to see all of you, kind of sort of see all of you. If you turn your cameras on, I can see you. It's really great to be able to join you this evening and wow. Welcome to 2021. Yeah, it's definitely uh, great to start off a new year. And what I wanted to do was stop by, see if chat a little bit about a couple of features that uh, we're working on. In particular, a couple of things, uh, predictive IntelliSense, something that we just released also called Crescendo. Um, also, towards the end, uh, give you some updates on what we're also currently doing. I don't know how many of you have seen the recent um, uh, release, or I shouldn't say release, but the RC of secrets management. So kind of let you know what's going on around on the PowerShell side. But first of all, what I really wanted to do was, if I can get my slides to move, is I wanted to, can you guys see the, oh, I'm trying to see if I can move this thing somewhere else and it's not letting me move that. Um, get this, oh, there we go, get that over here. Much better place. So the agenda is pretty simple. I want to do a thank you, a thank you to you, a very important thank you. I think this is kind of cool and also rather important. And then we'll talk about PS Readline, uh, Predictive IntelliSense and Crescendo and a few other items along the way. And to get off started, first of all, you know, Jeffrey Snover says all the time, you know, the world is a messy place. Matter of fact, I think uh, his recent version of the exact quotes here, the world has, has always been, is, and will always be messy. And one of the biggest challenges during this time, I think probably 
I don't know about you, but certainly for me and for a lot of us here, certain values have helped make um, the time that we've been dealing with both a pandemic and everything else that's going on move a little bit easier. And I just want to point out a couple of them uh, here is it, certain values like adaptability, adapting to all of the changes that we need, some resilience, some robustness, and also automating those things that are need to be automated. And that's in our own lives of dealing with this. And I, I just want to say that I, I want to give a shout out to uh, many of my friends who I've either talked through um, either on issues on one of our GitHub forums, or I've had a chance to talk with personally. Sometimes when I've been challenged by meeting some of these values during these times, they've helped me. And I hope you find friends that can help you through this. It's been an interesting period, but more so it's been also interesting on the PowerShell team. Because during this time, I mean, let's face it, I, I, I'm not speaking for the whole team, but we're a bunch of introverts. Matter of fact, Doug and I were just talking about this. We're a bunch of introverts. We like working from home anyways, and we've been productive. We've been productive, but so have you. And this is where I wanna start out with another part to the thank you, if I can get my slides to flip. You may have seen this before, and I wanna show this to you again. This is a thank you to you. This is a, a look at over the past year since, and I know the numbers are really small. I'll, I'll point out the, the important stuff, but this is December of last year up through, um, or excuse me, December of uh, 2019 up through November of 2021. Um, wow, is this a, a little bit skewed from what I was uh, going for? But let me just show you how this looked as we started to end off the year. The orange is in Linux. The blue is Windows, and here's the big thank you. Notice it's going up. <laughs> now, what really makes the difference is if I show it to you from this view here is a little bit more. So on the left side, what you're doing is you see where PowerShell 6 core, when its first uh, betas were out, and then when it released over here in, what well, was it, January 2018? This is the PowerShell core usage. This is startups per month of PowerShell. And again, in orange is Linux and in blue is Windows. And what I want you to notice is this is the big thank you to you is especially over this last year, 2019 and 20, we got our numbers wrong here. Look at the amazing growth that we, we experienced last year, thanks to you. And thanks to you, it wasn't just on the Linux side, which by the way, this is an awful lot of CI jobs automation going on there but the Windows growth. So people on Windows are downloading PowerShell 7. They're using PowerShell 7 and they're finding it to work out for their needs that they need it for and they're staying with PowerShell 7, which this is wonderful on the Windows side. On the Linux side, we kind of assumed that people would move there, but they did move there. So the biggest shout out is thank you. Thank you for your contributions. I noticed that um, uh, Doug's having uh, Jay Cool stop by and then James Brundage stop by. These guys, thank you for your contributions and for all of the help that you're giving by filing issues and having discussions with us. And thanks to everyone. If you're not out on GitHub, of course, we encourage you to come out to GitHub and, and is a great place to be able to talk to us about things that you may be having problems with or that you want changed or something like that, that you, you, know, you wanna give your idea of what you think but also for everybody who shows up to the forums and when you show up to something like this, your feedback really does matter and it's really impactful to us to be able to get your feedback and then be able to address it. This is a community product and we spend an awful lot of time going through all of your issues and thinking about what you're saying so that we can take the best course of action on it. So again, thank you for the struggle, thank you for making it and thank you for all of your help with PowerShell. Now, having said all of that, <laughs> and it's all true, but I don't know, let's do a little, little, little demoing. Um, so I'm gonna start off by showing you PS Readline predictions. I realize that many of you may have seen this, but I wanna walk through it in case that you haven't. And it's also a little bit confusing right now. We've got a couple of different versions that you can work with. And I want you to kind of see what those differences are so you know what you're getting into. And I also want to kind of end up the predictions by showing you what some other teams inside Microsoft are starting to do with predictions as well. And we, of course, hope the community will, will uh, be inspired by it as well. Well, to start off by talking about predictions, let's waste no more time. Let me go to Windows. 
So we're going to start on Windows. And on Windows, oh, let's see here. You guys have, uh, uh, this happens to me sometimes in Zoom, not so much in Teams, but sometimes in Zoom, I lose my mouse pointer and it takes it a minute to find it again. I know a PowerShell guy worried about his mouse pointer, but it actually matters at the moment. And of course, I just locked my PC. Now let's not lock the PC. There's the mouse. Okay, so apologize, technical problem. So you guys have, have been dealing with PowerShell for a long time. Let's go back to PowerShell version one. There were like 129 commandlets. Now in PowerShell version one, there's 129 commandlets. You could learn all 129 commandlets. You could probably learn all parameters, but you guys know that with PowerShell, starting with PowerShell three, oh wow, thousands and thousands of commandlets. And I don't know if you've downloaded the latest version of the graph commandlets lately, but speaking of thousands of commandlets and thousands of commandlets, it's hard to know any of these things. Well, now the PowerShell team put in things like tab completion. So when you start typing get child, if you wanted to type child item, what you could do is hit the tab key and it'll complete it for you. And if you're typing something else, like you just put in an S or something and you hit the tab key, it'll start cycling through the different commandlets. So the idea here is, is that for experienced users, you can quickly tab, you are accelerated to what you want. For new users, it gives you an opportunity to go, what was that commandlet and cycle through it. And you guys know, same thing, and I'm gonna pretty much stick to get child item here. Um, same thing with parameters. You can cycle through the available parameters, very useful. So the question is, how can we improve upon this? We have thousands and thousands and thousands of commandlets and we want to improve upon this. Well, one of the ideas is to kind of modernize the shell a little bit, the PowerShell, um, from looking at what some other folks are doing. Some of you may have noticed what Rust is doing and what Z shell is doing with putting up suggestions. That's where we started. So I'm gonna show you in a minute how where you can get this, but basically you can have predictions. And what these predictions are, and I'm going to turn mine on, and I'm going to show you more about this in just a second. So I'm going to use PS read line option. And I'm going to set uh, the prediction source to history. Now, when I start typing, now what's going to happen is, is that you still have tab completion. You still have all of those features that you were expecting to find. But now when I start typing, Predictions are gonna look through my history and see if it can find a historical based prediction that it can show me. So in this case, if I start typing something like get, whoops, there we go, get child item, it looks in my history and finds something similar, the first thing that it finds in this case, and provides it to me on screen. Now, as I start typing and changing the parameters and changing the arguments, it continues to go through history and find something. So this is the first thing it found with what I've typed so far. But as I type further, it goes further. But wait, I'm, I, can you guys read this okay on my screen? I'm thinking, I don't know about you, but it's, I, you probably can't see the prediction here. Let me accept the prediction so that you see what he was trying to put on the screen. The reason that you may have a hard time seeing it is that the default color for a prediction is a very faint ghost image. It's the same color that, that Rust uses and that um, uh, Z-Shell uses by default. Matter of fact, we had a team at Microsoft take a look at this and, and suggest to us what to use. This is the same color. I prefer our default color when I'm working, but I know it's really hard to see on the screen. So of course we made this so you could change the colors. Accessibility is very important. So let me just change the colors. First of all, I tell you what, I'm gonna show you what Steve likes to use. He is definitely, he prefers, oh, let me grab it here so I don't have to type it in. If any of you have watched me type before, you know that this is probably a good time for me not to type whenever possible. Let me show you Steve's color. So in PS Readline, you will be able to set the colors for these predictions. And Steve's favorite happens to be, whoops, 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 I messed up, do that, uh, not that, hold on, almost there. 
Let me just accept the rest of the prediction. So Steve prefers it when it's background highlighted like this. So I can do get child item and you can really see it and stand out. A lot of you see this if you use like uh, Chrome or something like that. Edge uh, for, is your browser, very browser oriented. This is a great color scheme. I'm gonna switch to my favorite color scheme, which basically is very affirming. It's, 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 I like my predictions to be positive and affirming. So let me just switch it to mine. The point in all of this, yes. So now when I type, oh, there we go. It's in nice green so I can see it. So the point is, is that with predictions, we're gonna let you customize this. We're gonna let you customize the key handlers. We're gonna let you customize what keys move you forward and backward through the words so that you can change them. Just like you can with anything else in PS Readline, we'll let you customize the colors as well. So set the colors the way that you like them. Now, once I have this set up, which pretty much is, is pretty simple, you get the idea. I now get these historical predictions. One question I get all the time is, are these the PowerShell history predictions or the PS read line? I, I, I realize there's some confusion around this. So you guys, um, when you run get history, not hoistry, history, his, his, I know, just accept the prediction. Thank you, PS read line. <laughs> When you run get history, what you're doing is you're getting the session history for your current PowerShell session. If you close your PowerShell window, that session history goes away, starts all over. PS Readline has its own history file that keeps your history across sessions, much more useful this way. And so that's the history that we're using. Now, let me just show you. If you wanna get these historical predictions, let me show you how to get it, find module, it would help if I could type on my screen, fine, ah, come on, type, 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 fine, there we go, find module, thank you, predictions, find module PS read line. Now, here's where I wanna be kind of cautious. Take a look at what's here. This is PS read line version 2.1. What this does is this gives you historical predictions like you may have seen with some other things like Rust or Z shell. This is great. What this does is this really helps experienced users accelerate. So if it's already in your history or you've already typed it, this means you can move much faster. And to be honest with you, it's gotten to the point now to where if when I go to a, a VM or a system or whatever that doesn't have predictions, it drives me crazy because I I keep expecting it to know what I want and to help me out and so it's now become for me something like tab completion. But I wanna go a step further. So this is where we went to kind of modernize the shell, bring it up to some characteristics that, that already exist. Next gen shell is where we wanted to kind of push this a little bit further. So, oh, you know what? Let me just show you this. There's something else you should, you should see before we start pushing the envelope. Remember how I was showing you this get child item stuff? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really good. But I just want you to know, I'm gonna switch back over to my Mac and bring up my Mac. I, I just want you to know real quick before I move on, of course, it's cross-platform, right? So it works the same either way. Oh, come on, how cool is that? I mean, it's really cool. <laughs> so yeah, it's cross-platform, uh, but, but wait, there's more. So you also, if you do a find module out there and it would just see what I'd say about my typing, it would just help if um, uh, find module allow pre-release, it would help if I just use the prediction, right? Um, if you do, if you look for allow pre-release, what you're gonna see is our current beta version of PS Readline. Now this gives you a couple of additional things. This has some things in it that we were working on that weren't ready for 2.1. So let me show you what 2.2 gives you. What 2.2 gives you is a couple of things. First of all, get child item. Oh, 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 oh. First of all, a couple of things. Get child item. This is nice, but I happen to know that I have other things in my history. So I, I think about this as I'm working. I'm typing stuff, a lot, like a lot of get commands, all that. And so as I'm typing, 
I know that I'm trying to do something and I just don't want to type it all out. So what we did is we gave you another view that gives you a, a longer list of your history. This is what we refer to as list view. And in list view, you can arrow down and then select the one. Oh, I didn't want the sort, I wanted that one. Then you can quickly select it and start using that. So some people, and the data is pretty early right now, I don't really know what the preference is, but some people like list view or like to flip into list view at times. And so we try to make this real easy. You press the F2 key and it flips you between list view and what we call inline view. Now it just so happens that I use inline view most of the time, but I think Steve and a few others use list view most of the time. So whatever your particular preference is, but you get those two views. But wait, here's something cool. How about this? How about, hey, how about this? It works in Windows PowerShell 5.1. So does list view. How's that? Is that pretty cool? So you can grab this module, either the released version 2.1 or our current beta 2.2 beta. And 2.2 beta gives you list view. So, and it works Windows PowerShell 5.1, works on Windows PowerShell 7, or excuse me, let me say that properly, PowerShell 7 on Windows. <laughs> and of course it works on Linux and Mac. Kind of cool, pretty cool. I'm not done yet because I got one other last thing. So it works on Windows, yay. It works on Windows PowerShell. I have one other thing that I wanna show you about this. Admit, I have, um, oddly enough, let me get rid of this. I wanna show you something else. And this requires, this will not work on Windows PowerShell 5.1. You need to be on PowerShell 7.1 or above for this. Um, I'm going to change, make a change here to my system. I'm going to use PS read line, uh, read line, uh, nope, read line, and I want my prediction source, whoops. Wow, my fingers are not moving fast. Enough. History and plugin. So, we made this as an extensible model, like a lot of things in PowerShell, so that other people can create plugins. Jayco wants to create a plugin. If Jeff Hicks wants to create a plugin, if you want to create a plugin, you can create plugins. I've switched this now from being a history based only to being history and plugin. And I want to show you what that is. I have one plugin installed. So one of the teams at Microsoft, the Azure PowerShell team, started working on a machine learning based provider. What this machine learning provider does is it scans all the examples of working with Azure PowerShell and basically provides you a giant history file in the cloud. Now it's an optimized history file, a lot of matrices, the matrices that go on with all of this, a lot of that ML stuff that's going on inside to make this really efficient but basically scanning the world for the best examples of working with Azure. They also put some intelligence into this. Let me give you an idea. Let's say for a minute that as a new user, I don't really know a whole lot about PowerShell and I don't know a whole lot about working with Azure, but I do know that I want to make a VM. Well, if I happen to know that the command line begins with new and VM, I could probably start working this out. So let's try it. New AZVM, you can already see the predictor working, right? He's trying to under, the predictor is trying to understand what I'm typing in and trying to give me a suggestion. You'll see that as it's giving me a suggestion with AZVM and it's saying AZVM config, well, I'm not really seeing what I want. Maybe I hit F2 oh, and I get a bigger list. This is what I'm looking for. I wanna make a VM. Well, to make a VM requires that I have a resource group. Well, let's, let's go backwards here. Let's, Let's, let's go back and, oops, that typed in a lot more than I expected. So let's just, I want you to see how the predictor actually moves with all the typing that's in there. So instead of VM, I need a resource group. Let's do, oh yeah, let's create a resource group. Oh, that looks good. Here's the interesting thing. Notice the arguments that the parameters are supplied with. This is working off of my history file. 
when you run this, this is going to look a little different because it's working off of your history file. So let's say for a second that you're working with Azure and you've just created, or you're working with a resource group called XYZ, it'll pre-populate it. If I create a resource group, in this case, I'm creating one. If I create a resource group called XYZ, when I go to use the new AZVM command, it'll pre-populate the argument with XYZ. That's what we're trying to accomplish. So basically some intelligence in there so you don't have to keep retyping things that you've already typed. How come you don't remember I've already done this? Well, now it does. What I'd like you to notice though, as I'm kind of showing you this while in list view is I'm gonna do something from history. Notice the right, it shows you what provider it's coming from. So as I'm typing things, you see a combination of the providers. So you know what providers you're getting things from and how that works. This is out and available now in preview form. As a matter of fact, let me give you a couple of quick uh, blogs to take. First of all, uh, there is a blog post uh, for the actual predictors out on the um, uh, PowerShell blog. There's also this post, if I can get it to slide over here, please slide over here. Too many things on the screen, come on. You can do it, you're a big computer now. Okay, it won't let me slide, come on, slide. Okay, he's not letting me slide, but I'll drop the link in the chat here in a minute for a blog post on the Azure PowerShell. So you can get the Azure PowerShell plugin, let me show you, by find module AZ, well, right there it is. Thank you, predictor. <laughs> find module AZ tools predictor will get you their current preview version. Now they're working on improving this right now, working with us uh, on PS Readline as we work on some improvements um, to what the, uh, how the predictors work. A couple of confusing notes right now to give you. If you wanna use a third-party predictor, you've gotta be using PowerShell 7.1 or above. The reason is, is that we have a, a special subsystem that was created to hold these predictors and a few other things, but to help us hold these predictors. We expect that there's gonna be some contention. Some predictors are gonna be ML based and have requirements, some aren't. So we have these in their own subsystem. That's what means makes it so you need PowerShell 7.1. That's only if you want a third party or a first party or an additional predictor. If you want historical predictions, well, you get inline view and list view and it works on everything down level to Windows PowerShell 5.1. So if you want both views, I'd say go out and grab the beta, a PS read line, and you too can start having your predictions rock and roll. Kind of cool, kind of sort of cool. What do you think? Yes, no, yes. That's no. awesome. <laughs> hey, so one acting is my audience right now. <laughs> I think I'll jump in. You keep looking for some feedback. So, um, but yeah, along uh, so along the uh, third part or, or making your own, I saw that you could make your own predictors or there's a plugin capability. I don't know if you can talk about that or give links to that or I've seen it, but I didn't deep dive it. So I was wondering, can you add some Yeah, knowledge? we need to work on some documentation on this and we, and, and that is on my list to get some documentation out. So there and if you want, you can email me direct or you can post on out in PS Readline and I can give you, there are a couple of functions that, that, that cool. you need to call to register the, the predictor when it's installed. As long as you call those functions to register it, that, that we can handle it on import and on removal, okay. then it, it'll be pretty straightforward. But we will have some documentation to help folks create their own predictors because I'm hoping somebody will create I could really use a Git predictor. I am so sick and tired of typing in the same stuff over and over again. Uh, Good idea. Thanks for the heads up. <laughs> um, so guys, and I'll, I'm happy to answer questions on predictions, but I, I wanna make sure that we have uh, plenty of time for, for everything. So um, unless you have a, a burning question right now, I'm gonna jump to Crescendo and, and, and start that story along. But predictions is something that um, I'm really looking forward to the future of this as we get more previews out and we get more ML or any kind of based predictors that'll help with this. Again, for advanced users, we found this to be a great accelerator. And for new users, it's been very helpful to be able to see things like mandatory parameters and, and, and uh, data types that are required. So, so check out the predictors, see what you think. And again, please 
if you run into problems or if you have ideas, that kind of stuff, go ahead and file an issue on us or join a discussion out on the PS Readline GitHub. Hey, quick now, question from the, from the chat. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, would a custom predictor be able to work with a PowerShell-based DSL? You know, that's a great question, and I don't see any reason why not. However, without, you know, actually doing it right now, uh, you know, I want to be kind of careful of saying sure, but um, it sounds reasonable to me. Yep. Good question. Good answer. Thanks. Yeah, great question. So let me switch topics on us for a second. This is something that's driven me crazy since day one of working with Monad and then PowerShell, right, is, is native commands. Native commands don't drive me crazy. Getting the native commands to work in my automation the way that I want them to drives me crazy. Here's the thing, native commands to me, and I say native commands, and, and not everybody really knows what that means. I mean, something like uh, IP config, um, right? Uh, let me turn off uh, the messy predictor here, uh, the uh, list view side. IP config, right? When you run IP config, it, it, this is a, a wonderful native command. We've all used this a lot to release, renew. I mean, eh. and if you're on the Linux side, well, you've been using lots of commands that are native for a long time. The challenge with these is, is they're very valuable. And well, they're very valuable and they're difficult to replace. So there's a lot of value in being able to use these native commands, but there's a couple of things. One, they don't have consistent naming, especially on the Linux side, um, or names that don't make sense. Um, I, I'm a big fan of short names, but not when I'm scripting, right? Because I get confused with, with little tiny abbreviations. So have better naming. I would really like the data, the string data that's coming out of this native command to end up as an object. Why? So I can manipulate it. I mean, let's take, I started on IP config. Take a look at IP config. This is not cool right now because if I wanted to do this, I think you saw my predictor showing this because this is what I always want to do, right? IP config. And then I just want the IP4 address, right? Because I want to use it for something. And we that blows up. It's never going to work. What if, though, you could do this? Get IP config. And you're saying to yourself, big deal, same thing. Well, not exactly. Select IPv4 address. Oh, there it is. And as a matter of fact, if I do get IP config, pipe to GM, I've got an object. Now look, what I'm showing you is nothing new, right? You can take a native command today and you can wrap it yourself you can, AP, you can, if it's API, if it's like a RESTful API, you can use auto rest and do it that way. You can take it and write PowerShell and wrap the command yourself. No problem in doing that. You can grab all the string data, convert it to objects, output that. No problem. We have the power to do that. The problem is, is that it requires a skill set that's pretty, pretty particular. Now, I realize that a lot of you have that skill set, but there's also a lot of you that don't have the skill set to wrap your own commandlet. Also, when you wrap your own commandlet, well, now you got to maintain it, right? Now, there's not a new version of IP config coming out, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, hope not. <laughs> um, but things like kubectl, Docker, those get updated constantly. Well, if you wrap your own, you now got to maintain it. So what the idea was is, is there an easier way we could wrap native commands and make it easier to maintain them? And here's what I mean by easier to wrap native commands. The rest of us that don't have that, that skill set to maybe use auto rest or to wrap it ourselves in PowerShell and don't have the skill set to can take all that string data and manipulate it and put it on objects, maybe we can make this easier for the, those people so that they can make native commands and in the process, make it easier for everyone to keep their stuff easier to maintain. So that's what we wanted to do. And that's where we're at right now with investigation. I wanna show you how this kind of works. So we're early days, 
right now on this. And you can find this by find module, wow, not even close, uh, module uh, Microsoft, there, there. I'll just, just let me take the prediction, right? <laughs> See what I mean by an accelerator and it helps save me time. So right now we have uh, this preview out of Crescendo. The idea behind Crescendo is to take those very valuable, very useful native commands. And we didn't want to manipulate the actual native commands because they're beautiful as they are, especially the newer ones are very beautiful. We just wanted to enhance them, make them sound a little bit better to a PowerShell user. So if you're a PowerShell user, this is for you to wrap them with. What this module does when you download it is Crescendo will generate modules for you. Let me give you an example. Uh, let's see, where am I at? Ah, perfect. So this module right here was generated by Crescendo. Crescendo will generate modules. They look and taste just like regular PowerShell modules. And well, here, let me just show you. It's so cool. So let me just dive into code. Let's go into code, take a look. When you want to wrap a native command, here's where we're at today. Not necessarily where we're gonna be at tomorrow. So right now, and on my screen, I'm not gonna dive into a whole lot of detail, but let me take you through this. What, what you're seeing on my screen right now is a JSON file. To wrap a native command using Crescendo, we use JSON. We're not using PSD ones, we need a schema. And there are some other ideas, and if you wanna contribute ideas, we have a great discussion going on on the GitHub repo for Crescendo. But right now we're using JSON, we wanted to schematize it, and here's the other thing. You probably in the future may not need to see, edit, or adjust the JSON directly. Right now you do. So that's a little bit, I know, a little bit challenging for those of you that aren't accustomed to working with JSON. VS Code has linters to help with this so you don't drop a, a quote or something like that. Here's what we've done for the JSON. The JSON has a schema and I've attached the schema file here. It's pretty basic. Tell us what verb you would like this native command to be called by and what noun. You give us the location of the actual native command and a description for it. Then you can specify how you want the parameters. What is the original parameter? And what do you want to call it? Don't put the dash in, PowerShell does that for you. So that would be dash all when you go to use it. It's slash all um, in, in with IP config. So you specify the parameters. So far, that's all you got to do. It's pretty easy at this point. Well, this part is where it's not gonna be easy. Taking that string data and converting it into an object. This is actually pretty challenging. And I know there's some people on the line that, that realize, yeah, this is this can be pretty challenging. So the output handler that I've written for IP config is, is what I could pencil together in string manipulation. To be honest, I think Jim had to make a fix to it or something like that. Um, so this output handler is pretty scary and I had to manually write this. We are working on this today. Uh, as a matter of fact, we are working on a couple of ways to deal with the output handler. Now's a great time to jump on the forums and leave us uh, some information and the conversations that are occurring about it. We're talking about allowing you to write your own handler if you would like for the advanced folks that enjoy doing that. We're also looking at trying to ease some of this for people that don't normally do all of this kind of uh, string manipulation and to make it a little bit simpler for them as well. So we'll al allow an external file is what we're talking about. And to make it simpler, one of the things we're talking about is bringing back and perhaps updating, now don't get me in too much trouble here because we're just talking about it right now, of bringing back convert from string and adding a little bit to it, maybe updating it a little bit to help us work with this a little bit. We've got a couple of ideas, but that's definitely where we want to make some improvements is to the output handler. Now, once your JSON files are done. Now, what I've done here is I've got a JSON file that does the get. I've also got a couple of other things you can do with ipconfig, like I want a new IP address, so I've got a new 
And I, you know, IP config release. Well, I've got to remove IP config to get rid of that IP address. Now I've got these as separate JSON files and I'm gonna build one module out of these separate JSON files. Going forward, we're gonna let you write all of these in one JSON or they'll be auto-genned into one JSON to try to make your life a little bit easier. Here's the process of what you go through. Once you have this handy dandy JSON file, however you got it, whether you wrote it or if it got generated somehow, once you have this handy dandy JSON file, here's all you gotta do. Why is my mouse pointer? Come on, mouse pointer, do that thing. Here's what you do. Yes, type export, export. Oh God, I hope this, oh, whew, thank you. Thank you, predictions for filling in. So you specify what those, what those uh, JSON files are. In my case, I, I'm specifying all three of them and then what module you want it to generate. And I might get an error message, yeah, because it already exists, because it's already been gen in my case, but then it'll generate the module. So let me just go in really quick and show you what this module looks like, and then show you something else kind of cool. So this module is, is, is generated, and it's probably no surprise to many of you that what we're really doing under the covers is we're just generating a proxy commandlet. So we're taking that native command and generating a proxy for it. Now, remember what we're trying to accomplish here. We wanna make this easier for a lot of folks that don't have the developer oriented skill set of, you know, uh, of API, you know, of wrapping their own. So we're trying to make this easier. Could we, you know, generate this proxy faster, sooner? We could, but it doesn't let people create the components that they need, adjust the parameters. So we've created this as a series of proxies inside of this module, and here's the best part. We, we, when we initially released this preview, we made a little bit of a mistake, so we had to release a, a 0, 0.1 add-on to it because um, I made the mistake. Oh, I just closed down my window. Let me bring this back up because here's what I want to show you. This is Windows PowerShell 5.1. Oh, where did my mouse point? Admit. IP config. So I've got this module right here. And this is Windows PowerShell 5.1, the module generated by Crescendo. Let's see what happens. Import. Oh, let's switch back to the inline view import mod. Oh, that's exactly what I wanted. Thank you, prediction. Well, let's try it. Get IP config. Oh, let's do a, let's just go all the way and see if it works. What is it? Yeah. Ta-da. So the point is, is that modules generated by Crescendo should work on Windows PowerShell 5.1 and above. Here's the scenario that I'm trying to achieve with this. Okay, I wanna wrap some native commands. I don't wanna do it for my own entertainment value, or maybe I do, maybe it's for me so that I can work better. But really what I'm wrapping the native commands for is so I can use it for automation on my other systems. Well, we really wanted these modules to work on Windows PowerShell 5.1 so that you could get this out to those systems running Windows PowerShell 5.1 and that you didn't have any additional requirements. You just deploy the module. Now, the native command needs to be available on those systems. In a lot of respects, the command probably will be because that's why you're automating that command on those systems, but you need to make sure that the native command is. Not only does this work in PowerShell 7.1 and in Windows PowerShell, I already showed you that, oh no, I showed you the predictor worked over here, but no, I cannot run get IP config on my Linux box. It's never gonna work. How many of you wanna guess how many times I've tried? Be just because it seems to be that way, yeah. So let me uh, do this. Let me do um, invoke who, invoke who, I got boot time, uh, invoke ls. By the way, these are examples that are in the module when you download it. So we've got Windows examples, we've got Linux examples of putting things together. Um, so we can do this cross-platform, 
Linux native commands, Windows native commands, things like kubectl, Docker, stuff like that, we can start to wrap with Crescendo. What do you think? Kind of cool? Now, a couple That's of awesome. things. If you hey, uh, to... Sorry, Jason. Oh, yeah, Doug, go ahead. Jeff Hicks has a question too. Uh, by the way, that stuff is awesome. I've been playing with it. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, stuff to still, it's only a version point, 0 0.4. So I'm sure by the time it gets yeah. to the it's going to yeah. get sorted out. Let me restate really early days. So your ideas, opinions, all of that really matter right now. And one other note before uh, 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 Jeff Hicks gets his question asked is um, besides working on the output handler right now, I know some of you are looking at this going, oh, what about sudo? Um, we're working on that right now. Sudo and run as so that you have elevation. Uh, we're working on right now as well. We're taking a look at. So, oh, what's Jeff Hicks's question? So Jeff's asking, uh, are you expecting people to write JSON files or are you thinking they will use Crescendo, use the Crescendo mo uh, commands, sorry, or they'll use the Crescendo module commands like new parameter info command line? Yeah, those, and if you've tried those commands, you probably haven't had a whole lot of success with those right now. Um, we're figuring, so here's the thing. My goal is not to have people learning JSON. Although, let's face it, it's, it's not that difficult and it's not that complicated to work in JSON. Um, it's not really the goal that everybody writes everything in JSON. Um, I've already seen some comments and some people that have done it. I don't know if you've seen Luke Deacon's blog post where he's generating the JSON from writing it in PowerShell. Well, we're talking about uh, auto-generating it too. And let me just give you uh, what we're talking about. So a lot of the newer native commands like uh, kubectl and Docker are my best examples to use for that. They have help that gets emitted uh, in JSON or XML. We can use that by looking at the native command itself and by reading that help, not only can we build help for you automatically, but we can learn a lot about the command, its parameters and how it works. So there's some of this, maybe a lot of it that we can auto-generate. And that's what our goal is, but it's early days in the investigation. So we're working on it. The goal is not for you to learn JSON. Although in this case, if you had to, it wouldn't be that bad, but yeah, the goal is not to, to, to learn that. So, with Crescendo and with PS Readline, let me show you a couple of other things, see if that inspires some questions. And of course, it's open to questions at this point, anything you, you, you wanna talk about. Let me show you a couple of other things that I have uh, up here. Oh, what's next? First of all, a couple of uh, things. I wanna let you know if you didn't know that Sydney and Secrets Management, wow, Sydney's PMing Secrets Management and Secret Store, and this is, is pretty incredible stuff. They just had a, the release of their RC. So if you want to take a look at secrets management and secret store to help with um, managing your secrets, PowerShell get we're working on for this release. Don't have any additional information right now. There's some pretty interesting work uh, that's going on for that. Um, 7.2 LTS. So we're working on 7.2. We're up to, what is it? We, we, we just sent out preview two. Um, that we've been working on. Our goal is to ship um, with the .NET team. So towards the end of the year, about that November timeframe, we'll see how things fall out, but we, we expect to be shipping 7.2 LTS at the end of this year. And hopefully with new uh, release versions by that time of all of our predictors and crescendo, secrets management, that kind of thing. Um, one of the interesting things that just happened is PowerShell is available on the download uh, from the download center. So you can download it right into Windows, from Windows, into Windows. Go right out, type in PowerShell, you'll see it. Boom, goes right on in. Um, we will be having continued previews, of course, on all the things that we're working on. And some of you, uh, I wasn't demonstrating this today, but we did a lot of work in PowerShell 7 on module compatibility. I know that there were some modules that didn't work. Um, in PowerShell 6 because they were written on PowerShell 5 with the full .NET framework and we had a reduced uh, framework and things weren't working. We've worked a lot on that compatibility. So um, we think we've got about 85, I think, percent covered. Uh, basically most of the important stuff, there's some stuff on like SCSI drives that I don't know how we'll, we'll ever get to, but um, 
couple of other things too, what to watch for. First of all, you can download PowerShell off of our AKMS link. Um, 7.0.4 LTS um, just recently released. Um, 7.1.1 is out. And if you're on our 7.2 preview train, well, then we're up to preview two. Ah, I should have looked at this slide before I was guessing. Um, you can get to more of our projects. You can follow us. And I've got a couple of uh, the actual blog posts, but you can just go right out to our, our PowerShell team blog if you want to check out the blogs on predictive intelligence crescendo and a whole lot else, secrets management and the latest goings ons there. So what do you want to talk about? And let me do this. I'll stop sharing my screen for a second so I can get a look at the chats. And really folks, that's what I really kind of had um, set up to kind of show you today. What do you think about predictions and crescendos? It's something that might be useful, something that, uh, If anybody wants to raise their hand and we can un unmute and you can ask questions. Um, I like the concept of crescendo. I built a few things with it. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's challenging. I can see, you know, getting into the weeds pretty quick, but uh, I think it's got some yeah, real teeth. Yeah. And Doug, and, and, and really to, to, to all, all y'all, uh, uh, <laughs> if this is, if, if wrapping native commands, even if it's something that you're just doing, you know, on your premises and that you're doing, take a look at Crescendo. And I had somebody that did on our first release that took a look at it and did a short video and put it on Twitter and then um, connected with me. And, you know, these are some things that I had problems with and that I thought were, you know, it wasn't the right direction. Um, please join us on GitHub, uh, at GitHub Crescendo. You can join our discussions, file an issue on us, talk to us about it. We're really early days. Now's a great time to provide feedback. Oh, and I want to give a shout out because I think I saw, I don't know if he's still here, but J. Cool was the first PR into Crescendo. Thanks, J. Cool. You made me really happy that it was you. I know it was kind of a simple, it was kind of ridiculous, but cool. Thanks, man. Was that the ternary? Did he do that or something else? Oh, he had, we, we still had, uh, what was it, J. Cool? It was a GitHub, um, it was a GitHub link that was in the code that we didn't need to have. That we had to pull out. Um, the ternary, I think uh, if somebody alerted us to, I think when we released within about two hours, somebody had pinged me about, hey man, you left the ternary in and you left the ternary in your example. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my God, we worked so hard to make sure that wasn't there. So we, we fixed the ternary problem. Hey, Marcus, do you want to ask a question or you want me to unmute you? We'll do that. Uh, hey, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's more of a statement than a comment. Crescendo seems like an interesting tool. One of the things, um, I guess, making it more practical, is it only for native commands? Or can you use it for like uh, anything that's kind of like, uh, um, I have a program that's written in uh, C Sharp that I might like to wrap. Uh, would Crescendo be a good uh, tool for that? Well, you know, I, I, this is the interesting thing is, is, let me answer the question directly. Yes, I think so. Now, I know that sounds like a kind of sort of maybe answer. We've been testing as for native commands. However, any executable on, on, on either platform, you should be able to wrap with Crescendo. It's the, that hasn't been our focus. But yeah, any executable, you should be able to wrap with Crescendo. Um, so I'd say give it a try and then see what we start to bump our heads into. I mean, we knew we were going to bump our heads into things like elevation, right? Pseudo and run as, and, and we sure did really quick. Um, so absolutely, um, I'd give it a shot. Um, while we're designing it for native commands, it could be for programs, I guess, especially if you want to use it for automation. Do you see the other questions? Um, so someone's asking. Oh yeah, as a matter of fact. Uh, so at this time, we aren't planning on writing a a mod. We're not planning on writing the JSON for Kubernetes or Docker 
in its complete state. Although there are some samples of that in the crescendo module if you download it. Um, obviously there's, a matter of fact, I think it's the getters. We haven't done any, we didn't do any setters, but we, we did some getters as, as part of our testing and investigation. Um, so we're hoping that the community might do the, you know, would do that. And in a sense, it's, it's kind of like, if it's valuable and Crescendo seems to provide that value, then we would hope that the community then would, would build those, those modules for us. Um, uh, another question that I saw is, uh, could you use Crescendo to generate proxy commands? Yeah, Crescendo is generating those proxy commands. You can pull them out of that module, use them any way that you would like. Um, would really like to see more PowerShell for accessing MS graph endpoints. Hey, um, I know the graph team, I, 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 the graph team is working really, really hard <laughs> right now on their commandlets. Um, they've talked to us a couple of times recently, so they're, they're working really hard on them. I'm hoping that that improves. Um, something else that I, I saw hanging out there. Oh, what else was there? Um, can you talk more about predictors for Azure? Is it guided by human suggestion or all generated by ML? So I know that Microsoft's a large company, but we don't have a lot of people sitting there behind her going, hey man, what do you want to suggest to this person? <laughs> Um, I, I realize I, I realize what you're saying. Are, are they handwritten by humans, or but they've, they've been machine generated thus far? All machine generated, and we've had great results out of that. Now, as far as how the underpinnings work in the ML, I think we're going to start um, the the PM that works on Azure PowerShell team that's been handling all this has been Damian Caro, and I think Damian and I in a couple of months. Maybe, matter of fact, that'd be a great time to come back, uh, are gonna put together a conversation about the ML inside and how that's working. But in a nutshell, we're scanning examples, examples from the docs, examples from the forums. And I say we, but the, the ML team is scanning the examples and then putting those into matrices and getting them to line up on what ones will be suggested. When you use the ML-based Azure predictor, what's happening is, is as you type, it's going to a server and saying, this is what I got so far. What do you got as a suggestion? And that suggestion is getting displayed to you. When you accept an, a, a suggestion, that gets sent back to the server that it was accepted so that it knows that you might be moving on to what might be the next step. Let's say you made a resource group. Now you're moving on to the Azure VM. So we're trying to make that a little bit more open so that people can understand how they might be able to write their own. As soon as we have that information together, we'll, we'll give you some more information. Um, I'll jump in on that and say that sounds, that sounds really cool. I know that Facebook, and I'm gonna, some, somebody can correct me. I believe it's either, I think it's open API, like they are scanning all of GitHub so that you can be in any programming language. You can be in, uh, you know, Python or Rust, and as you're sitting there typing, it'll figure out, oh, you're trying to create a function or you're trying to create some uh, C-sharp class, and it will actually boilerplate for you based on the AI that it's been doing, reading all the best, and as you're typing, figuring out. So I think this is a great direction, make my life easier, make me more productive. Uh, so we'll have you back in uh, September. That would be awesome. And, and, and I don't want to make it sound like, you know, we've got all this super crazy magic that's really making this rock. No, we're we, on the ML side. We're also in, 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 you know, we're investigating this and we're trying to understand what kind of predictions work best and when and where. As an example, the inline view where you see one line versus list view. There are different things we can do in list view that may be better when we're trying to provide you with a tokenized suggestion in this prediction. Um, and one other note that I would make, yes, we've started, because everybody asked me, um, yes, we've started conversations of moving, getting predictions into VS Code. So we are gonna talk about that and we're, we have some other work in VS Code that needs to be done first on the PowerShell extension. But yeah, we are gonna make sure that you can get them in the tokenized suggestions into VS Code as well. All of this is in its early days of investigation uh, when it comes to the ML side and the VS Code side, but it's showing a lot of promise. We we believe we might be able to 
to hit the targets that we're looking at. Cool. Yeah, the mega ball predictor, I've, I, trust me, what do you think the first, when I sat down with a data scientist, the first words out of my mouth were, help me with this. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, if I could, I would, but eh, it's not working out so well for me <laughs> on that. All right, what else can we talk questions? about? Uh, what do you think? Hey, I'm good. Folks, um, let me just say that um, if you get a chance, try out the predictor, try out Crescendo, really want your feedback. This is an awesome time, but this is early in the year and we're really looking forward to the 7.2 um, release. We're working on a lot of projects. So come on out to GitHub, take a look at what we're working on, take a look at what we're posting in the blogs and give us some feedback because I, I know you hear it from us all the time, but literally I was just sitting here this morning talking to Damien about the AZ predictor, looking at some feedback that somebody had sent us and went, that's the idea we've been missing. So I don't care who you are, your idea is not stupid, it's not dumb, it's not unworthy. Come talk to us about your ideas because it helps us. So other than uh, the GitHub to talk about, is there anything, any other place to find like, uh, you know, I know you're going to come up with some posts about the mechanics and the, and the mechanisms under the hood. Is there any place to go research that or reach out for? Or? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I would, at some point, I would, I will gleefully say, yeah, here, here's the docs on that. Since we're in very early days on the AZ predictor and stuff like that, we, we still have to catch up on our docs. But as we get docs, right now, I'd say, look at the blogs and look at our PRs going in. But yes, we will get a excuse me, official docs up that will start to help you with some of those. I think we just got one more. Any ETA on when the Visual Studio Code Command Explorer would have feature parity with ICE's show command add-on? You know what, that's a great question. And um, Sydney is the PM that, that works on VS Code and she probably has a much better answer than than I do, because the answer I have is, I don't know when that's occurring. I know that we are doing some important work right now on uh, script analyzer rules and some stability factors in VS Code, but um, uh, I can certainly find out for you if you want to send me an email at jason.helmick at microsoft.com. Uh, I'll find out for you. And yep. Ask Sydney and let you know. And and oh, I, Jeff Hicks, I just noticed said any news on DSC. So let me say this: if if you haven't heard, the PowerShell team is is now uh, uh, taking on DSC again, and we're doing some work on DSC right now. That is uh, work that is helping um, Azure and Azure Guest Config. You may have heard that what we're doing with DSC right now is we're um, we are no longer using MOF as the intermediary. We're gonna to switch to JSON as the intermediary. Again, like the old MOF files, you shouldn't have to see much out of it, but we are gonna to switch to JSON. Um, the MOF is an old artifact from when we had all the SIM uh, uh, stuff in. And so now we're switching to JSON. It's gonna be faster for us. And also um, you may have heard in this, Steve has a, uh, a PR up on that, it, that talks about this. We're also switching to class-based resources only. Now, don't panic and don't freak out. Um, if you have script-based resources, don't worry. We're working on a conversion to convert them to class-based. But it's easier for us maintaining going forward if we can reduce what we have to maintain. And one of the things that we believe in is that class-based from the DevOps community has come across clear is the best way to go. We need to do some work there. So we're gonna do some work on the class-based and stay focused on that moving forward. And that switch to JSON. At this time, that's all we have to announce on DSC is that important work to try to get going. But I would say that throughout the year, we'll have more that we're talking about with DSC. All right. Yeah, Jason's eating the world. Yeah, yeah, it, sort of, it does seem like it. <laughs> All kinds of way to do configuration. Um, yeah. So I think that's good. I think uh, that's enough questions. Somebody did ask about Pulumi. 
Um, I like Palumi. I don't know if you've played with it yet and how it stacks up against DSC and ARM. They're different, different, two different concepts. But what the interesting thing is about Palumi is, is that some of the rock stars from Microsoft, like um, now I'm forgetting their names, Joe Duffy, uh, who worked on the dev div team for like over a decade, um, is one of the compiler developers on that team. And basically compilers, um, when a compiler team starts to work on things like DevOps, you get a whole different way of looking at solving problems. So you can actually sit there in multiple languages and create how you want to provision things across different cloud providers. Uh, and they've done, they're doing a really amazing job getting tremendous in investment. And uh, if you look at it, it'd be, you know, it, it, it could blow your mind. And I know I've had some conversations with them about how to, how would, uh, how could we plug PowerShell into this? They do have a .NET yeah piece that works but uh they're sticking with things like python go and um c sharp and typescript for the moment anyway oh, I, else we got? i'll have to check it out that sounds really interesting um it, and, and, and and you know it's definitely something that with dsc you know as we move forward we're, we're definitely going to want to engage more with the community directly on dsc we've already started talking to more of the devops side on dsc but in general we want to talk to the community and, and start to get some feedback because you know, from when I started doing configuration management, you know, it's been, I don't know, five, five years, four years, something like that. Um, things have changed a lot, um, both in, not only in configuration management, but what the, what the goal is with configuration management. And sometimes DSC is the right answer. And sometimes DSC is not necessarily the right answer in a certain pipeline. So we want to be able to get a chance to talk with it with everybody and find out what everybody's needs and desires are with DSC um, as we uh, uh, move forward with it. So we got another question uh, for an org that is Ansible focused for Linux today. Is there any interoperability with PowerShell? I'll let you handle let me make sure. Like. I, yeah. Is this? Uh, is, is, go ahead. Is the question more along the lines of kind of like DSC or that on Linux? By interoperability? Good question. Is that what you mean? Uh, Andrew, do you want to expand on it? And let me just say this. Um, we are currently in right at this moment working on DSC and Linux. So we have some work there. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was talking, I don't know if any of you uh, use guest uh, 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 config and something like power stig um, for the stigs that come out. Um, DSC on Linux is very important to us. We're working on it right now. I don't have an announcement there, um, but I would say, oh, you're probably going to start hearing more from us on DSC and Linux in the next couple of months. Uh, we are putting quite a bit of time into it. Now, if you're working, if you've been working with it, you know that we've got Invoke DSC resource on the Linux side, but we still have some other work to do there. So we are in process. If you're looking for better interoperability between Windows and Linux using DSC, yeah, we're working on that. Um, and that's active work that we're doing right now. All right, so I think we'll uh, look to wrap up. Jason, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Hey, Doug, and everyone else, thank you so much for having me here. I look forward to stopping back in with some new information when I can, and thanks for your time. Excellent. Okay, everybody, have a good one. Good night.